Welcome to the International Business and Law Academy. My name is John and today I will be looking at the general principle and service of NAFTA. So to recap, NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreements and we will discuss services related to finance, transportation, telecommunications, and the difficulties and advantage of integration of Canada, the US, and Mexico. So the general principle in services. NAFTA service providers may not operate in any member nations without establishing or maintaining a residence in that country. Service providers that are owned or controlled by persons of non-NAFTA nations may not take advantage of um, these reforms. So the service agreements grant NAFTA service providers three fundamental protection. National treatment, most favored nation treatment, and procedural transparency in licensing requirements. So firstly, in financial service, um, any provider of NAFTA countries may establish banking, securities, and insurance operations throughout the free trade areas. Each country now accords a nation treatment and most favored nation treatments to these financial institutions. Next, in transportation, the three members agreed to a um, timetable for the removal of barriers to land transportation services and agreed to harmonize technical and safety standards in the land transportation industry. And thirdly, in telecommunications, these, these will be non-discriminatory access. Um, private companies from the three members country now receive reasonable and non-discriminatory access to the telecommunication network transports throughout the North American region. And about the investments, the negotiators set out an investing agreement that contains several broad governing principles as well as various country specific reservations and obligations. So to clarify these issues, I invite you to discuss more about the national treatments or most favorite nation treatments principle or to understand more about all the services. I right, turn you should start us off. Uh, we should talk more about the national treatment. Uh, national treatment is an integral uh, part of many world trade organizations and agreements, which affects the free trade and of NAFTA. Uh, national treatment is one of the cornerstones of the World Trade uh, Organization trade law. It is the found in all three of the main uh, WTO agreements and uh, also the GATT and GET and TRIP. Yes, I agree with Warren. Now, national treatment is a basic principle of GATT that prohibits discrimination between imports and domestically produced goods with respect to internal taxation or other government regulations. Yeah, um, adding on to Anne, we, I think we should talk more about the most favored nation treatment, which um, is also abbreviated as MFN, and it's treating other nations equally under the WTO agreement and countries cannot normally discriminate between their trading partners. I agree, but this one just... want to add more. When a country wants to grant someone a space or favor, such as a law or custom duty rates for one of their products, they have to do the same for all other WTO members. All right, so can you bring back to NAFTA? Um, uh, yes, Jen. Uh, return to NAFTA. The general principle is uh, in service. I think uh, Mm, in the financial service, NAFTA's uh, country permits their residents to uh, freely purchase uh, financial service and generally may not uh, intact uh, any restriction on cross-border trade. But the treaty will permit each nation to impose a restriction for balance of payment and purpose. Alright, so what about the transportation part? Well. Canada strongly demanded that shipping and other forms of transportation be included in the NAFTA negotiations. However, negotiators was constrained by the Jones Act, a U.S. law that restricts maritime trade between U.S. ports to ship built in the U.S. and operating under U.S. flags. Yeah, so you made some great points. And um, transportation is always a controversial issue, but because it's involved in border, sea, and immigration issues. However, as I have stated, um, as a result, the three members agreed to a timetable for removal of barriers to land transportation services 
and agreed to harmonize technicals and safety standards of the land transportation industry. I think we should also discuss more about the field of telecommunications because we should also talk more about non-discriminatory access, um, which is that NAFTA recognizes the right of the countries to grant monopolies to telecommunications service providers. However, it requires that the partners ensure the provider do not engage in anti-competitive conduct that, in, um, that would injure persons in the other NAFTA countries. I think we should uh, also talk more about removal of uh, hidden barriers. The agreement contains several provisions guaranteeing that the rules governing access to and use of public networks and service and publicity available. Uh, uh, in the field of investment, uh, most of the discussion involved is effort by the U.S. and the Canadian interest uh, to pursue uh, Mexico to relax, to surf the restriction on the foreign investment uh, and to provide a adequate methods for resolving investment disputes. Oh, the, negotiate, the negotiators, mindful of Mexico's history of expropriating foreign investments, also enacted certain rules to govern expropriation. In particular, they required that such takings may occur only in non-discriminatory manner for a public purpose. Further, the expropriating country must promptly pay the investor the fair market value of the property plus any applicable interest. Yes, I agree with John and information. Finally, Jack Cross has a dispute settlement mechanism for emendying violation of investment rules by host country. All right. So that's that was a very thorough discussion of the general principles in services of the three North American countries, while also pointing out the differences and limitations of principles. All right. So to clarify, um, let's all look at a case study. All right. So this is the case of fresh silk or force import from Canada. So here are the facts. The U.S. International Trade Commission (ITC) ruled that the U.S. domestic pork industry was threatened with material injury by the importation of subsidized fresh chilled or frozen pork from Canada. Several, several Canadian parties appealed that the terminations for, to a bi-national panel compromise of the three Canadian and two U.S. members. The panel held that the ITC should reheard we hear the matters because the original member, the, pen, the the original findings were based on faulty statistical analysis. During its reconsideration of the case, the ITC gathered additional evidence and again ruled in favor of the U.S. port industry uh, during the original hearing. The panel severely limited the issues as well as, as the legal and economic agreements. The ITC could consider on remand. After following these uh, narrow gu guidelines, the ITC uh, unanimously concluded that the pork industry was not threatened with the material injuries and by reason of the Canadian imports. The US complained that in its second remand, the bi-national panel departed from proper procedures and exceeded from its authority. So accordingly, the U.S. requests the information of an extraordinary challenge and committee to review the actions of the bi national panels. So, th there's an issue that evokes here. Did the U.S. state raise issues sufficient to support extraordinary challenges to commit inquiry? Right, Ruby, can you um... start us off? I think no, because the bi-national panel substitute for judicial review in countervailing duty and anti-dumping investigations. It is not the functions of the Extraordinary Challenge Committee to conduct a traditional appellate review regarding the merits of a panel decision. I also agree with Ruby. I think it's no, because none of the allegations and the present provides uh, a base for finding that the panel is seriously departed from a fundamental rule and um, procedure of man manifestly exceed its powers, authorities, or jurisdiction. That's very true, for none of the alleged errors materially affected the panel decision or threatened the integrity of panel review process. Alright, so thank you for the discussion on the case study. 
And I would like to bring up the question of this case again, which is, did the U.S. state raise issues sufficient to support an extraordinary challenge committee inquiry? So the decision here is no. So the extraordinary challenges procedures is intended to review the binational panel decisions only under exceptional circumstances. The binational panel substitute a for a juridical review. Um, countervailing duties and anti-dumping investigations. None of the allegations presented here provide a basis for finding that the panel seriously departed from a fundamental rule of procedure. And so none of the al like that. none of the alleged errors materially affected the panel's decisions. Alright. So thank you uh, very much for um, discussing on these issues and you can let me know if you have any questions. All right. Thank you to the International Business and Law Academy and Dr. Song. Mm -hmm. <laughs>